we've got a little review of engineering to go over. We're going to do engineering. We're also going to do flight sims uh, simulation. So we're talking about all of the flight changes coming to the game as well, including new, new quantum travel, quantum break, control surfaces, and some changes to combat. It's actually a pretty big panel this one as well. So this is going to be an important day. We're going to go over a lot today. Uh, I will try not to interrupt too much, but you know I'm going to interrupt constantly. So I won't make that promise to you. Um, to start out though, we are going all the way back to the first time we got to hear about engineering and sort of their plans and goal for it and their vision for it. Uh, hopefully we don't have to raise the volume on this too much. I'm going to go ahead and do that just right now so we don't have to do it later. Um, so this is just to kind of give you a little prep for what we're about to see in the flesh finally, the, the solid three years after this. Let's get into it. Prototyping, especially for anything gameplay related, is to prove that it's fun. If you don't have it fun with a cube and a sphere, you can put all the pretty paint on top of it. It's never going to be fun. So with the resource management, we have this idea that there is one uh, way the resources are managed throughout the entire game. There's one way to consume them, one way to produce them, and all the items everywhere, they use the same, the same system. So we started by creating this small example of a ship where we have a power plant, we have a, a fuel tank, a battery, uh, we have lights inside the ship, uh, we have turrets, we have weapons. We try to build a priority system so you never want your lights to have the same priority as for example your power plant or your weapons. Basically as soon as we start the simulation the power plant goes I'm online now but I have no fuel. So all of this energy right now the lights start draining the battery. If we put some fuel in the full fuel tank, as soon as we put it in, the power plant starts going online, the battery starts repl replenishing because there's not that many uh, consumers online. If I go, okay, let's say I set my weapons, my uh, laser weapons to fire, as soon as I do that, there will be more drain on the energy. We can actually see we have a, a simulation of resources. We know we're producing this much power and we're re requesting this much. We're, we're running everything through exactly the same system. Now, uh, same thing, let's say someone takes out our power plant because it got shut down or got sabotaged. Automatically now we're, bat we're on battery power. It might go, okay, we don't need weapons now. We're gonna turn them off. Lights, I only need the oh, one Oh man, in the front, guys, so I just I realized that I got you guys all messed up again. Once I repair my power plant, <laughs> there you go. Sheesh. Start turning Sorry. stuff on again. And this was our first thing we did where we built the ship. And this we built this tool in a way that allows us to build different ship configurations. So as you can see, you can kind of understand the, the basic shape of a hammerhead. As soon as I turn on the simulation, uh, we can see we have a pop to both okay, power so plants. Are here's, here's the first big thing, uh, notable compared to citizen con for three years they used the hammerhead as their test case i could show you the other videos they've done um we saw one at citizen con last year you may remember where they showed this in act in in engine not necessarily with the gameplay involved and uh they've always had the hammerhead be their sort of testing case now not only have they they use the a1 for their testing case in the citizen con demo but they also um they also mention it in the monthly report. No, I mean, yeah, they might mention it because it's work, but it seems interesting that they did that instead of just using a hammerhead. And I'm wondering if they're kind of working through ships quietly to get them updated for this and not really mentioning it or or what? Oh, I meant the A2, yeah. I'm, did I say A1? Um, so yeah, it's interesting that they're showing this, but you're getting the idea already from how he's explaining this, that like, this is what's supposed to make the game less pay to win. This is what makes the game less pay to win in that it takes your big ship and it makes it a little bit more vulnerable if you're not actually properly crewing it in in uh, the situation it's supposed to be made for, you know? Are, are starting to produce power. The fuel tank gets uh, starts to get drained. The battery uh, is on full on full capacity. We have these relays. Relays are a new concepts that we're, we're introducing in the ship. In order for all those resources to travel from the fuel tank to the power plant, from the power plant to the to the battery, from the battery to the lights, everything travels to this uh, this uh, these relays. 
now each relay you have on your ship is going to consume power so the, the less you have the more efficient you're going to be the more you have is going to be you're going to be more redundant for example in this case uh, let's say someone sabotages this and they destroy this part you can see already this part of the ship lost resources if we lose this one this power plant is off let's say now I have I need to start shooting so I'm I'm manning my turrets and they're shooting I'm starting my uh, uh, hammerhead doesn't have these weapons exactly here we're just trying to simulate a, a ship at this point you will start notice my lights started going off because in the priority my lights are very low priority if you look at the battery the battery is starting to drain let's say at this point it reaches zero it ran out now this turret is off it doesn't have power this one is not running at what in what we requested because there's only one power power plant running right now now if i have a mechanic on board he'll go okay this relay is broken this relay is broken get power back to that power plant as soon as we got power back to the power plant we're starting to get our resources back lights start going back online we're back in business at this point but let's say we have i don't know a smarter saboteur that goes well i kind of see how this ship is configured i'm actually going to cut it in half and this is usually like a worst case scenario the the system is smart enough to understand the idea that once the ship is cut in half this front part of the ship has its own resource network and this part of the ship it's its own resource network so it runs them independently so everything in the back gets powered by these two power plants but anything in front it's completely dead because our battery is dead as an engineer your main your main goal is going to be to to keep your ship as operational and as efficient as possible so let's say now i'm transporting goods i'm just moving from a to b it's a crew pleasure cruise no problem i never want to travel like this each of these relays is going to be a drain on resources so i'm going to turn this one off because i can i can turn this one off and i can turn this one off and powers power and resources still have a route to travel and i'm still keeping everything online i'm trying to minimize the number of things that I'm powering on the ship so this would be a, a viable configuration in which I'm, I'm still keeping everything on the ship fully functional but let's say I go into battle with this configuration into battle if I take a hit here and this gets shot or gets sabotaged I instantly lost to half of my firing power firepower so it's a good thing to use when you're not in danger when you're in danger you just switch stuff uh, to a more redundant system Besides this, with all the overclocking and setting power levels, setting resource levels for each item, setting priorities, I think that the engineer is going to be a, a crucial part of the ship. So this is where we are right now with this prototype. Uh, this is going to take quite some time to implement. This touches <laughs> on a lot yeah. of systems. A lot of stuff no will kidding. have to get refactored. But we're hopeful that once this reaches uh, the live environment, this is going to make the game so much better for everyone involved. Agreed. Um, so that was our first look at how engineering was supposed to work and, um, it was rudimentary, but you get the idea of like, it, everything needs to be balanced and looking at how that's supposed to function, there's going to be a ton of UI for it, right? Like you got to have UI to set the priorities, UI to set roles, uh, UI to see all the things, to interact with things. It's going to be a lot. So that's what we're about to look at here. Now, going back to my, uh, pay to win comment. When I, when I said that, I'm going to get crucified for that in the comments. When I said that, specifically, I'm referring to combat ships. If you were to have an Aurora and uh, you went up against somebody who had a hammerhead, there's a pretty big discrepancy in terms of combat power. And you can get that discrepancy by paying for it. That is obvious. It can't be worked around uh, when it comes to winning in the rest of the game, building a farm, mining a cave, surveying a planet kind of hard to decide what's winning for each person but in combat obviously you can buy a more powerful ship once you actually have to start crewing that ship though and paying attention to how it runs it starts to get more difficult and somebody did mention ai blades and npcs in chat but again the the idea of pay to win generally should if if they can work their missions and reputation systems and rewards for everyone correctly and give everyone the experience they're looking for it's a big should but if they can i said big <laughs> um then it really should only matter when you're in a pvp scenario in which case you're always going to be at a disadvantage if you're using ai blades or npcs in a pvp scenario 
because they're just not going to be as good as humans no matter what unless those humans are really bad but i th i think like players will be able to use those things for their general situations pve in which case it's not really affecting other players too much um but i don't think those components will be as skilled as a player is going to be on a different ship or on the same ship i guess all right let's get into this vi video Hello, I'm Thorsten Leimann, uh, lead systems designer for the EUPU team and uh, welcome to this little presentation of our most ambitious feature uh, that we are working on for quite a while already. We already talked about it several times, but this time it will be a little bit different. So before we start jumping into the presentation, here's a little disclaimer. Everything that you are about to see in this presentation was done by the EUPU team, so, well, mostly. We got help from the vehicle content team and the VGPU team. So what you will see here is mainly placeholder art that was either done by Guillermo, Bastien, or me, so members of our team, and it's gameplay that we focus on in this presentation. So what you will notice here is also that the UI is still work in progress, so uh, visual changes even throughout this uh, entire presentation. So we are still iterating. But let's start with the actual presentation. Those that follow us for quite some time probably know that about the resource network already, but let's do a brief recap. We will be talking here about our technology, that is resource network, and the engineering gameplay that can be called a child of the resource network. The engineering task will allow you to manage your ships, outposts, and possibly other things. Let's have Guillermo uh, talk about the technology first. Uh, so I welcome think, on. I think that might be the only time they talk about that here. Um, but it is, that's a very important sentence he said. The resource network and engineering gameplay is not just for ships. We're going to be doing this stuff in cities, in outposts, in space stations, uh, and I guess ground vehicles, you probably said ground vehicles at some point, but it's, it's going to be pretty widespread throughout the game. On stage, uh, Guillermo. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Guillermo Bilbao, gameplay programmer for this team. And I'm going to talk about the research network. So what is the resource network? Uh, the main drive for the resource network was replacing the previous pipe system you might have heard about with a new system that was uh, more generalized, easier to expand, and that would support all the gameplay we actually want to do. And yeah, so it is a network, as you can see on that picture, uh, showing the connections between different items, even those inside of your containers. And it enables specifically the relay gameplay we're going to show right after. So it ha will have a global impact. You're going to see it in ships. You are going to see it in outposts. It's built to work with the cargo system in some ways. And as for interacting with it, uh, the engineering gameplay we're going to show today is going to be the biggest example. But you will also see it in other places, especially in missions. And let's have Thorsten talk about it a bit more. Yeah, they're, they're really, um, this is actually a, a pretty broken down version of the overall gameplay because they have different roles in engineering. I actually didn't get to sit down and see this whole thing, so I'm seeing it first, but I did see bits and pieces of it. And I don't know, I don't think they went over all the roles, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I guess we will find out anyways pretty soon here. So hello again. So as a crew member of a ship or oh, hey, as look. a person managing an outpost... Literally the next slide, he talks about the roles, Jesus. Outpost, you have several responsibilities, um, where the engineering topic can be split in three activities, and you can decide to share those responsibilities or take them all by yourself. It's really up to you. 
Every task requires their own skills and their own tool sets. There is tuning. Here you are responsible for preparing your ship. Your journey did not start yet, so you adjust your ship items based on your goals for the travels. Exchange sub-items, adjust the default settings of your power plant, basically operations that require you to turn off the items or even remove them from its, their sockets. The next activity is maintaining, and this is all about damage control and keeping the items in pristine or pristine enough state. You are the mechanic uh, that makes sure that everything is and stays operatable. Maybe even go further in the sense of caring for the items. And what caring means is here reducing the wear and tear rate by regularly removing dust or oiling the items, just as, as some quick examples. So let's actually show you some of the maintenance you can Oiling. do and will be able to do. So here we start with two gameplay mechanics that are already in the game. So technically nothing new, but the entire engineering loop ties them nicely together. Uh, here you saw me collecting uh, IMC or still collecting. Does that animation play out when you reload this thing? I don't think I've ever reloaded the multi-tool. And uh, now I will take the shield generator of the recently destroyed Gladius uh, to use them as a spare part for myself. So all of this is, of course, optional. So you can pur purchase those items already and in the future even assemble them for yourself. So crafting. Um, Just drop the C word in there real quick. While the Fury approaches, uh, you might get the glimpse of a debug UI. So the, there is the Fury now coming. Uh, I activated uh, the debug UI to show you the health state of each item. And uh, what you should have seen is that the shield generator is fully destroyed and the power plant that I'm about to take out now is uh, in low health. Low health means you can still repair it. So which you will, will be happening now with uh, Guillermo and Pete uh, repairing the power plant after I removed it from the Fury. So it's making it fully functional again. And here you see the debug UI, the health is now fully up again. And Man, I'm trying to take, trying to account for the health of all your components in like a single seater fighter or something. Or I guess in like a, a heavy fighter that has a lot of components, but nobody else to account for that. I guess that's going to be part of the co-pilot seat in, in a lot of these ships. And that means that it runs at, uh, at full, uh, yeah, full efficiency again. And here you also see that the shield generator is at zero health. So the destroyed shield generator cannot be repaired because it's destroyed. So I have to exchange it with the spare one that I collected from the Gladius. Yeah, but what do you do with it? Just chuck it? Chuck it into space? So with all those repairs being done, uh, the Fury is operatable again and it can go its way. Cool. <laughs> it's like it's a really simple demonstration um, because it just works how you would expect it to. It doesn't really feel like a lot because that's just makes sense. But like the enormity of all of the things coming together from the component being physicalized to the tractor beam working on it to the power actually flowing from the component into the ship and the ship understanding what's going on is uh that's gonna be that's game changing actually game changing i mean you can't just have a a, a couple of like the the idea of having eight different ships um for example they had a shot in isc what was it earlier this year where they had like 20 furies on a um on a C2, I think it was, maybe, or an Idris or something. I don't know. But they had a ton of ships fly out of this one big ship, right? Woody Bear, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate you. Um, and when the ships flew out, it was really cool to look at. But now when you're looking at this and realizing, hey, these ships are sitting on your ship, they're going to need to have spare components. 
you're gonna need to be able to repair them. You're gonna need to be able to uh, maybe switch out a couple of, of, of spots and you have to be able to store that stuff too. So you need cargo space for those extra components if you're carrying a ship around that you want to use a snub fighter, which means now we're starting to limit the amount of ships you can bring on a ship, changing up the whole pocket carrier dynamic and maybe making something like the Idris much more valuable than an 890 jump. That being said, there's still tons of cargo space outside of hangars, so it might not limit it that much, but like that's just an example I think of how there's a ton of knock-on effects from this kind of change. You'd have loved to see repair gameplay somewhat like mining gadgets, attach repair gadget to a component, get a readout, tweaks and buttons and dials while gadget goes to the repair, no beam required. I don't think this is repair gameplay. Um, this might be like a, this is a, this is a placeholder essentially for the demo. You can actually look up Star Citizen repair design documents and you will get a full readout of their early plans for repair gameplay. I don't think it'll be exactly what this is, but this is getting, they, they try to follow these design guidelines. Um, repair is going to be a lot deeper than just pointing a beam at a ship and making it work. Those are more of like the personal multi-tool field repair kind of stuff. Whereas you also have component damage, subcomponents, modules, and armor. So, um, I would wait to see what repair is going to be. I think this is just kind of temporary right now. So getting back to the responsibilities, uh, a big one is managing your ship, which includes resources, but also more general aspects. Uh, you have to manage the power distribution and come up with informed decisions, like reacting to hazards, like malfunctions, fire, low energy, but also calling out items that need repair and maintenance. You will delegate the rest of your crew to keep your ships intact, like giving clear priorities of what needs to be done first. Let's take a look at another video here. So this is the first glimpse of the engineering UI in action. It is still being worked on, so it's heavy work in progress. Uh, let's start with looking at the item view. So you can see the full setup of the network with the relays, the green dots connecting to each other and the relays connecting to the items. Color and shape uh, below the icons should help you identify the different item types like power plants, weapons, also have helping differentiate between consumer, producer and converters. You can tell the current state of the item, that means the amount of energy it produces, consumes or has stowed the health state it is in, the current wear and tear on the item, and the current state it runs in, like charging or being in an idle state. You can directly interact with these items, turn them on and off, and in the future even switch their states. If you hover over a relay, that I will be hopefully doing soon, <laughs> You will also see that the amount of fuses that are still active and, uh, yeah, because a relay consists of several fuses, basically uh, they're their own uh, set of lives. And here you see all the, the details. Like you can click on the items to see a, a 3D render of the, the power plant here, uh, the quantum drive, sorry. And here's the, the relay overlay. Uh, here Pete shoots a relay to show the UI updates on the screen. So once this relay got shot at, you will see the update here on the UI that suddenly the entire right-hand side of your ship lost uh, power connection. And what you might have not picked up on the screen is that actually the power plant here that I'm now focusing on is on low health. So I'm commanding Simon to repair the power plant to get it fully operational again. So something to highlight here, take a closer look at the doors. Since we also track the door states, you see that uh, you can watch movement inside your ships now nicely. So you can track players moving around in your ship and even close doors for okay, them. Okay, this, like this is, oh man, oh god, this is like one of those side effects from this system that I didn't really think about. Um, so cool. And I'm betting 
you're going to have access to this. Whereas people who are on your ship, but not part of your crew and are just like scanning your ship probably won't be able to see actual movement. So you have a huge advantage, um, advantage up on people doing this. But I, it's, I think it's, this is a lot of what we've been waiting for in terms of ships actually mattering and feeling like spaceships instead of just every, like your Starlifter not just feeling like a bigger, small ship, you know? Um, this is also what causes multi-crew. Uh, like Chris said in, in, in chat, he'd love to fly with the crew, been looking for it, have joined several large orgs, and it has been non-existent so far. The resource system would be great if folks would be willing to fly together. Star, Star Citizen is a game of push and pull. The game has to pull us into the gameplay that they want to push. Nobody's going to fly multi-crew ships because there was no reason to before. There was no life support. There was no um, redundancy. Like you, you got more out of flying two small ships than one big ship. Now it's possible that you're going to get more out of flying one big ship than two small ships. This is all part of the whole point of pushing people towards actually trying that gameplay. That's why they're doing this. Up until now, nobody had a reason. Now people have a reason. And as this comes into the game, they will have to tune it. They'll have to make it so that it's not too much of a drag. Um, they're going to have to take feedback from people to understand what people like and don't like in live. And that's why it's kind of nice to be playing an alpha while it's being made. Because we don't have to see this gameplay and realize that this is our permanent future. We get to see this gameplay and then we get to talk to them about it and tell them, hey, this kind of sucks. Change it. And they, they do. We've seen it multiple times when things go back to the drawing board or get changed pretty drastically. So let's give them feedback on this if we don't like it, huh? Compartments in this case where Simon just forgot to close the compartment. Um, yeah, so Pete destroyed the relay. We need the ship in fully functional state. So um, yeah, I'm running now with a fuse and place it on the in the relay so make the relay work again. Um, what you can also do with the doors is that you can create safe pathways because you sitting at this engineering space. Does the silhouette of this look kind of like Serenity to anybody else? Just like a little bit. I think it's because of like the curve right here. You can see. We I mean, have more information in regards to your ship than the others. So you open doors to create a path that the players on your ship has to have to take. Um, now to the room view. That is mainly the life support controls plus controlling all doors. Uh, again, we show the details of each room, like the temperature, pressure, atmosphere composition. So everything that is relevant for like you living on a ship. We also show the door states where you can now have precise control over each door in your ship, as you see here. Uh, this will also allow you to have a more control over which door or compartments to open. So here the, again, showing the opening the power plant. That also helps very much in, in already telling players, hey, you should repair this item, so I open that door for you, and they directly know which item you mean. Um, it also allows us to control like the outside facing doors much better. So you can directly open, if you just want to open the left side ramp or the front side facing ramp or the back facing ramp. This is going to be hefty to use with a controller. This is engineering gameplay, Captain Danger. I hope he goes more into life support. This is from CitizenCon. So we did it last year already, but uh, let's make our crew suffocate again. So the moment that you basically pull off their helmets and now me pressing the cycle button, you see that the entire atmosphere in this room is vented. Hey, and why is it that I keep saying things and then he just does them? Maybe I should just not say them or should I keep saying them so he does them? And yeah, well, uh, the con consequence is uh, death. Man, you're going to have to really trust your engineer. 
So as you can tell, engineering gameplay will bring a lot of changes. Uh, some of those changes are adding batteries to ships that will allow you to get a little bit of extra power for a short amount of time. Allowing you to control items directly, where it's not only their on-off state, but also their resource consumption. And where the biggest change that will come in this update is, to the resource, is basically to the resource consumption and generation. So let's talk about energy balance. Currently, ships are balanced such that they consume less energy than they produce. What I mean with that is that the sum of all items or, uh, requires less energy than the power plant will provide. And uh, this has to change. The energy rebalance that I will explain to you now will affect mainly bigger ships. Single-seaters will, will still behave like they do now. For big ships, we will focus on item groups. Those require energy, but your ships will not provide enough energy to have all components run at 100% all the time. Instead, you have to decide what you want to have permanently powered by your power plant. So managing decisions will have an impact now. You could decide, as in this example, to shut down your thrusters to turn on the weapons. Isn't the best choice, since you will not be able to maneuver, so might not help when you are attacked. You would be able to shoot, though. I mean, this is like this is pretty standard across uh, space games in general, where you have to balance power systems and weapons and, and thrusters and something. So yeah, I think this part is it's not it's not necessarily the concept of this whole thing that people are more intimidated by. I think it's more the way it, it plays out, which is like more in person. Because this is like, um, I mean, this is how it works on Star Wars Squadrons, right? Um, how it works on uh, Elite Dangerous, Starfield. There's just more of it here. So I think... Um, yeah, I'm really interested in how they add uh, the processor works, actually, because we haven't gotten too far into that. In scenarios where you need to react, you can activate the batteries and use the additional power. Batteries won't last forever, but you at least can power additional systems. You will be able to recharge the batteries again, but you need to free up energy from the power plant to direct into the batteries. I think that was a little bit more than just a recap, but uh, now Guillermo will talk about malfunctions. So I will talk about malfunctions real quick and get you guys to the next video since we're a bit behind schedule. Uh, what are malfunctions? You've seen misfires in the persistent universe for seals, for thrusters. You've seen a very basic version of it. We're making them more complex. We're making them more lethal in some ways and more fun to interact with. Uh, also, uh, some of the new malfunctions will include fire, uh, spreading misfires that represent electrical surges going through the ship, or uh, signature bursts, which increases your signature and makes you show up on enemy sensors uh, uh, more easily. As for how you will counter them, uh, you've, saw, you've seen suffocating people with life support. You will also be able to suffocate uh, the fire with life support, which is probably more useful. Uh, you will be repairing them, not necessarily only with a repair beam, but also replacing parts or some uh, bespoke uh, behavior per misfire. And if all else fails, just turn it off and on. And here's a video of the fire in action. Uh, you've seen in other videos the fire. This is a small fire. You can just put it out with a fire extinguisher. Pretty simple. It just works. It just works. Uh, here's a bit of a bigger uh, fire. It might be that you cannot only put it out on your own. So here we have one crew member that's going to try to put it out with a fire extinguisher uh, to mix results. And here we have the option of using the life support system to also sort up uh, uh, before and yes, bend in the area. And now you can see that the fire, uh, once we get to that compartment, has been successfully put out.
Okay, so let's get Thurston back on stage. Uh, you, see, you saw uh, a lot of the systems in action, but let's get a video of one of our play sessions, which is going to probably show it a bit better. So, yeah. Um, I have to excuse myself already because I, I was leading this group of players being attacked by, by the Gladius and I did a poor job, but more to that uh, in, in that video. Um, yeah, yeah, we wanted to talk about... So for this demo, we have modified the damage system slightly to uh, represent impact penetration on a very basic level. So you are going to see that the, quant uh, the quantum drive is going to be... I'm actually really back. surprised when I was thinking they're going to show all this stuff they showed us last year again. I was thinking, man, I hope they show it to us in game rather than in engine. And they're actually, this is basically the same demo they ran last year. Um, but last year we only saw relays. We only saw the engineers back end, like UI and all that stuff. Now they're actually showing us the entire gameplay surrounding this. It is pretty cool. See how it plays out. By the Gladius attacking the ship. So, yeah, being attacked by a Gladius for an A2 isn't like a big challenge, but in this setup, we were not like fully staffed. That means we had our engineers running around and uh, yeah, no one being seated in the in the in the turrets. Uh, so, yeah, our our goal was basically to flee the Gladius, and uh, yeah, with the Gladius actually shooting the, the quantum drive and damaging it. I thought, hey, it's a good idea to, to tell uh, Pete and Simon to, to repair the quantum drive as a priority. As you can see, uh, I somehow missed that uh, the habitation room caught fire. Um, I tried to, yeah, well, um, prevent further damage to it, but uh, yeah, I, I, I failed. Um, yeah, so. Uh, that, that was causing a bit to the panic, so I even yeah, this, got distracted in this moment. Not gonna lie, um, this also again, it's, this is all gonna depend on how you look at this. Some people are looking at this as what they have to do. Um, some people are looking at this as the gameplay it provides for anybody to do. I think the second way is a little bit better for people who want to be engineers. I think this is amazing because the. The suspense that you have watching a fire break out on a ship, trying to figure out which components are powered, where that fire might go next, where are people, you know, like a passenger transport gameplay becomes more complex because of engineering. It provides you more to do than just sit on your hands and fly a ship. Now you have to sit on your hands, fly a ship and make sure people are comfortable with their life support. In combat, you can't just shoot your guns. It, it, it has to, you have to shoot your guns and also pay attention to where the other guns shoot you, like in No Man's, or uh, Sea of Thieves. I, I love that this feels like somebody is going to be able to be proud to say, I am a, I am a, I'm a Hercules engineer. Um, or somebody could be like, I'm a hammerhead engineer. I am an engineer for Aegis ships. I'm an engineer for reclaimers. I get jobs, I work on crews who are flying those things. I put myself out on the job board because I know where all the things on those ships are. Seems like a really cool way to uh, let people specialize in something that you can't really do in many games. And so uh, we, we managed to have- And like, 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 uh, I'm, I see people saying this in chat, uh, planes don't break down all the time. Spaceships don't break down all the time. Um, people also don't fly 40 million kilometers to another planet to get pizza like this game is going to have a lot of things that don't act like real life because if we played real life it probably wouldn't be super fun have the quantum drive survive but here i notice oh actually the the power plant also starts to take damage and at this moment i'm also telling uh pete and and simon to to switch their attention to the power plant because if we use lose the power plant it's also like almost impossible to flee so here i, I realize oh my god we are going down fast and i think at this point now yeah i opened the uh compartment to make it access faster but that was already too late so the power plant died and yeah so uh, the backup is to activate the batteries which i did here so the yeah um, Simon and Pete still tried their very best to, to fix it, but um, yeah, didn't manage to. Um, yeah, uh, the attack moved to the forward side, uh, 
targeting the, the, the batteries because the player who was attacking us actually knew the ship layout. And uh, yeah, here I, I noticed that the second power plant has also got attacked, so have to redirect the, our, our mechanics to it. And uh, at this point, we wanted to flee, and then I realized why, does, why doesn't the quantum drive work? And uh, as you saw, that there is a relay that also got destroyed. So uh, here you see it very clearly that yeah, with a relay being destroyed at the, at the quantum drive position, that means that the quantum drive cannot be accessed from the, from the pilot seat. That means that uh, yeah, I, I also had to get that repaired. So it was uh, a bit chaotic. Um, everything was also happening a bit too fast. Here, trying to save the second power plant because we are we're already running out of battery life. Uh, so, yeah, if we would have lost uh, the the second power plant, that would have been our certain death. And I think at the yeah, in the next part of the video, um, yeah, we yeah, basically asked someone to to fix the the relay at the back so that we that's still be able to that's also what he just mentioned is part of why um it's it's part of why uh the sorry i got distracted by a thing on youtube it's part of why um the the component system is is changing i think they're probably giving ships smaller components but more of them for redundancy kind of like what they did with the zeus and um, they'll probably do it with other ships so that even though this is a system that might get people in trouble when they're in combat, the way that ships are built now will allow people a little bit more of a, uh, you know, free time, even if they are leaving things un, un, unmaintained. Yeah, so we at least managed to, to save one of the power plants. Yeah, that's, that's now, uh, I think it was Pete running there and fixing the fuse. And the next step was uh, the pilot trying to push uh, the, yeah, the, the quantum drive, but it was too late. Uh, we died. And <laughs> the end of the show. Yeah, thanks. So... What you just saw gives a good idea of, idea of how busy ships will be and how, what meaningful uh, multi-crew gameplay will look like. But what about the future? Since we worked on technology that will be used throughout the entire game, you will see more and more coming utilizing this tech. It will introduce... This is pretty important as well uh, for folks who are talking about the amount of time it needs to take. Time to kill for ships is going to go up a lot because they're not going to just blow up anymore. They're going to take damage. You're going to lose parts. Components will uh, opponent, components will still be able to be killed and shut down, but it's going to take a lot longer for ships to actually become disabled. And even after they're disabled, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die and you can't still use the systems. So um, just keep in mind, there's there's a lot of ship systems besides engineering that aren't going to impact how this works. System, systemic gameplay uh, with allowing players to come up with creative ways of uh, manipulating their environments. Sabotaging a power plant or destroying a vital relay that connects it all to shut down an entire enemy base that can include its life support or security systems. It will also tie in nicely with Maelstrom that you just saw. Uh, and anything that will break off will lose its connection the network to the network and therefore have an impact on its functionality. So it's a real systemic feature. The technology allows us also to take further steps into the crafting profession as well as in the base building, where both are related to each other. Bases built by player will also form resource networks and come with their unique challenges similar to ships. We are already we are all really excited about the future of this tech and all the associated features. So there's a huge thanks for, for all people involved. So thanks to the entire EUPU team, the vehicle teams, Jared, Active Feature team, and the Arena Commander team. They all were super supportive to get this uh, behemoth into a state 
that you could see here. And it's something that has been a long time coming, and we are really proud of it. So thank you for sticking with us on this journey. Wait a second. Was Dan Truffin's name on here? How is Dan Truffin's name on here? I feel like it, he's the one who's always presenting this the last few years. Is he not? No, he's not on EUPU. Is he? He's on EUPU. I don't know. That's interesting. Either way. Us There's a team on this journey. Uh, that's engineering gameplay. I think, I mean, we mostly talked about it as we went. So you got most of my opinions on it, but um, I, this is important stuff. I mean, they obviously have to make sure this isn't going to be too much of a drain on people. The most important application for this is going to be on small ships because um, that's what most people will be flying. That's where it needs to be the, the least hands on probably. But it also needs to be featured in a way people can like jump into it and still try it out. So that's going to be an interesting application. I think for large ships, people should be expecting this to be a pain. Like this is part of the balance of capital ship and large ship and even medium ship gameplay. Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, it's a, it's a huge balancing act. Like, I mean, you guys know, you know how this works. They're going to put this in the game and it's going to be wildly off for a lot of different ships in a lot of different ways. And then over the years, we'll have to figure out how it works. This game's still a while away from uh, from where it's going to be. They did it with mining. They're doing it with salvage. Um, all kinds of stuff. All right, let's get into ship flight. Let's get started on this. There's a lot to change here. I'm most excited about the quantum travel stuff, but we'll talk a little bit about ship flight. I'm sure you guys have more opinions on that than I do. And I'd love to hear them. Let's do it. Hello, everyone. Is my mic on? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fine. Uh, these are the wrong slides. Hang on. Well, hello everyone. My name is Yogi Klatt. I'm a principal vehicle programmer at Cloud Imperium Games, and I focus on uh, space flight and the um, and space combat. I really love my job, so this is why I'm really excited to show you the progress that we did on Squadron 42 in the last two years. So there's two things I need to say here. First thing is we're doing a live demo, and the build is about 12 hours old, so there is a good chance. <laughs> There's a good chance for, for bugs, which, um, well, if you see them, just, just look away. It, it will be fine. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, um, I'm not flying myself today. It will be Brent Gunzinger. Where's Glenn? He's using a setup of two VKB sticks, so left and right uh, HOSA setup from VKB, and he's also using the fantastic Toby device. So we'll swap during the presentation between using hat tracking and not using hat tracking. Um, yes. So, but the good thing is, the relationship between you and your starship, it doesn't start when you take off. It starts way before that. There's a lot of stuff we do now in pre-flight. Um, so please welcome back Ines Kaldas, who will walk us through that process. Is this working? Yes, okay. Hello everyone, it's a privilege to be here back on stage to tell you all about the, what you can expect about the player interaction experience inside your cockpit. If you, like, I've told you before how we've been working towards improving the player interaction experience all across our game. And we wanted to bring these improvements to what happens inside the cockpit. So we wanted to give you a greater immersion and Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, the slides are not, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, so you want to give you a greater immersion and have, and give you a closer experience to what pilots go through in real life, not only when you're flying around your ship, but the moment you take your seat at the cockpit. So to achieve this, we've created, a, when you enter your ship, you'll be put in what do we call a new relax pose. So in this pose, you'll have free look enabled, so you can easily look around the cockpit 
and your dashboard. <laughs> the prompts will be showing over the button so you can easily find the ones you have to interact. And you, the pilot, have to press all the different buttons to get your ship ready for flying. And the character hands will be lowered away from the control stick. So all of this blends neatly into our new player animated interaction system, whereby any button is now physically pressed. So this new system uses what we call a CDIK approach. This stands for code-driven IK, or inverse kinematics, and gives full control of the IK setup to the code. So this, among other things, allows us to record the path of the hand relative to its target. They've so talked a lot about this tech over the years, and I'm wondering if this is something that they're going to have to do custom for each ship, or if this is because they've talked so much about this being part of their flight experience team setup, if this is something that the ship's kind of, it's more system driven because it's inverse kinematics. Since all the buttons are already in their place, does that just mean that the inverse kinematics can guide the hand there or do they have to get creative? Because there's also buttons that are out of reach on some ships. Um, gonna be interesting to know how that works. And yeah, the flight ready button is going to stay on this ship. I think what they're going to do is tuning gameplay is going to start at the very basic level with your ship startup. That way, when they introduce engineering gameplay through tuning, small ships, large ships, medium ships can all take part in it, but you don't have to because you could just hit the flight ready button. Maybe, I don't know what they would do, but a custom startup would probably give you some buffs compared to a, a regular startup. And the buffs could be your ship starts faster. Maybe flight ready, you hit the button and it takes five seconds to start. But if you hit the sequence of buttons, you can do it in two. I don't know. But I think there are going to be some benefits to using, turning on different systems at different times versus not. And uh, yeah, we'll have to see how long it takes for them to implement this and have more detailed animations than just simply blending the hand into position. So for example, we can open a flap and then press the button. But you know, enough of me talking, let's go jump into the demo and see all of this in action. So now. So Brand very kindly will get us into the ship while well, you'll see the new enter sequence. And you'll see the new animations we have been working on. Remember, the Gladius is the test bed for this kind of stuff. So you can see now that you won't directly grab the control stick. You'll be put on this, free, on this relax pose with free look enabled. And you can see the different prompts appear over the buttons. So let's get this show started and get your ship ready for flying. So, Brand, if you could close the canopy so we don't go flying around with that open. Power our systems. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and finally, turn our engines. Yeah, so we are, you are now ready for flying. So we will be, be bringing all of this to all of our ships in our fleet. And that's all from me, so please walk, join me in welcoming to the stage Tony to tell you all about the new UI. I um, totally understand that there are some usability concerns here, and that's stuff that we probably will, will need to continue to talk. I really like the Aegis UI, though. I think it does so much better at just letting you see what's in front of you. Like, I, I didn't mind the UI before. Um, yeah, it was busy, but it told me the things I needed to know, but I, I really like how much more clear your sight lines are with this. This stuff is small, though. Not gonna lie. Hi, everyone. My name is Tony. I'm senior UI programmer here at CAG. And I'm here to explain some of the spoilers that you saw yesterday about our new ship UI. So, are you ready to see the ship UI in action? Yeah. <laughs> right. Bone, play the demo. The, I mean, Brandt, continue with the demo. 
So as you can see already, this ship has less intrusive UI with more space to enjoy the stunning vistas that planets can offer and less clutter views so you can focus during combat. This also means that the UI elements are now more relevant to the situation, linked to the operator mode. For example, when we change to scan mode, the crosshair has scanning information about your target and even the MFDs have changed. Some of these elements can be customized, but we'll see more about that later. They really uh, went and changed the, custom, the, the MFD, the direction they were going in. Let me show you guys what they had before. This is what they showed us as an early sort of previs of what they were going for. Um, and you can see they got like, for instance, here's the power triangle. Oh, he's on the scanning UI, hold on. They could do the operator mode. So like the power management triangle over here is like, they've given us, they've given us a lot larger surfaces to look at. And then the self status, like you can see it was tiny here. And you know, the designs for these looked good but the ones that they gave us seem like they're much better for visibility, for being able to interact with them, for feeling a little bit, I think, less hectic about trying to pinpoint the exact spot on a small UI. So I appreciate that. It, it looks larger, it's easier to understand. For example, when we change to scan mode, the crosshair has scanning information about your target and even the MFDs have changed. Some of these elements can be customized, but we'll see more about that later. For this demo, we're showing the UI developed for this Gladius. Basic information related to navigation will always be available on your view, and this Gladius displays all of that with holograms around the dashboard. But other ships may have different layouts and styles on brand with the manufacturer. For example, the Drake that makes more affordable ships rather than fancy and probably expensive holograms, may use physical screens, dials, and light indicators. This dashboard shows your current speed, the remaining afterburn, and some decoys available. On both far sides... That was also kind of a small thing he dropped in without really getting too deep into it. Um, but the uh, he did mention there that UI different ships will have different types of UI. So we don't really have too much visual information on that but i think i might have yeah so here's kind of like an example of what drake's ui might look like and i think even as he said it's going to be more physicalized than this this is a this is an old ui like they're nowhere near this loud anymore as you can see from what we're looking at here but this is just to give you an idea of how a drake ui can differ from what might look like a Aegis UI, which this is the old concept for Aegis. Again, you can see that they have made it a lot less intrusive, but that's just to give you some kind of context of how Aegis style can differ from Drake style and how that might translate into the game later when we start to see different manufacturers' HUDs come in. We have status indicators that will show things like if you landed gear is on or any, any other flight systems. Worth mentioning that we have prototyped these for the demo, so right now they are holograms, but on the final design, these are going to be physical screens. On the far left, on the top of the dashboard, we have the indicator of which master mode and operator mode are you on. So let's change that to combat and talk about these new MFDs. So we have reworked all of these MFDs from scratch with brand new views using our UI technology building blocks. We can still navigate through these MFDs using the classic mouse interaction, holding F and then moving the mouse. On the left here, we can see the scanning view, which is going to show information that you obtain when you scan a target. It may show information about the ship name, One click the to pilot switch name, is nice. or even the current operator mode of your target, so you know if they are just chilling around or they are ready to fight you. Cycling to the left one, we have the target status, which will focus on emissions, damage, and orientation of your target. We'll see that in action later. The next one, continuing to the left, will be the self status, which is contextual. So during navigation, that will show your current fuel, but during combat, like right now, will show information about your guns. You can click on the gun, and you can see basic information about that. That's we'll see the name. way better than using that list view and, oh man, the the 
the usability of these MFTs is so much higher. I hope that like Elite Dangerous though, we can kind of set a button to focus on it if we need to. Um, and key bindings to switch them obviously are gonna be really nice. As you can also see in Grid's group, they are assigned, which Yogi will explain later. On the MFT on the right side, we have the power management, where we can distribute the power of different systems of the ship. You can click on the triangle and move it around to change the distribution, and you can turn down the total power of the ship that will generate. I do wonder why they used a triangle with like no corners. I guess they have corners, but like it has what six corners instead of three. So like where I, I guess you you just put the flat side to the flat side makes sense. I guess, but like the top of the flat side is that more or less than the other side? I don't know. It's probably confusing. I'm talking about these these little sides on the power management. Like you could put this point up here or down here. Like what's the difference? And why isn't it just, I don't know. I guess it's because flat sides, they gave it flat sides, whatever. The classic key bindings that you all know already works. So when you change the power management, you will see now a triangle on top of the radar to show you the changes. Now, instead of using mouse, you can also use key bindings to select MFDs and cycle through the views, which might be faster when you are in certain situations like during combat. And for those pro players out there, we have added about a hundred key bindings, and I mean a hundred, to navigate through all of these systems, so you can fully customize how you want to navigate through them. Wonderful. And I really hope that's more than enough to use on your keyboard, on your HOTAS, or even on your game class setup. But if you need more, just let us know. Anyway, I think you're not gonna need even those many shortcuts. For this operator mode, we now persistently save which views are shown on each MFD. So you can customize what's important to you for every situation. So as an example, during combat, you might want to have target information on your MFDs, but maybe when you change to quantum travel, have your current fuel, spend some time on the configuration screen, for example. Let's talk about this configuration screen. We're going to have now here a variety of options, from customizing UI elements to enable systems of the ship. We may see some of these later in action with Yogi. These settings are now available on this screen, not in the global settings of the game, for quick access. So just as a warning, expect changes on the settings that you already know, but we'll tell you all about it when we have it ready. And the important bit about this is that they will persist to your ship. So you can keep different setup of which UI elements and even ship systems enable for how you personally use each of your ships. Yeah, see that's, so we're gonna be able to change our MFDs for each ship, each flight mode. And I guess, I don't even know if did they mention each person. Like if you fly a ship and your friend flies, flies a ship, will it recognize you? I, I might've missed that. This is a, the usability of this, like you take just these changes and that changes the flight experience. You take these and add it to like the FPS updates and that's huge. Each of the things that they've shown us working in game during the Citizen Con were super uh, crucial to this game feeling better. And I'm uh, just super excited. I'm so, so happy that it's actually in game, all this stuff and it's not just like slides and talking. Granted, of course, this is a closed environment with this specific ship, but it's still something that they have working. You know, that's nice to see. Now, some of you might be thinking that these Gladius settings have enough MFDs. Can we enable the top setting? For those of you that you want to see even more information, you can now cast versions of these MFDs to your helmet. They've talked about that quite a bit in the past too. For this, you're going to need to equip the appropriate helmet so it's connected to your ship and get, I can get all this information. See, a lot of this game is actually going to depend on which helmet we're wearing. Um, they still haven't gotten a ton into that even during this CitizenCon, but that's 
the whole visor system is actually, I think, going to be pretty important going forward. You can use the key bindings, as I mentioned before, so you can select which cast you want to control and how to cycle through them. So you can pin views that are important to you with, with your, that will move with your camera. So as you have seen, if you're aiming at the target or if you're moving with your head tracker, those views are going to be always with you. With all these tools, you can customize your experience and have it ready for every situation that you encounter with your ship, always displaying the relevant information to you. So for example, during combat, you may want to have all the UI elements enabled, all the pips, all the crosshairs, so the information of your ship on the physical MFDs, and maybe focus on the target information on your cast, so they're always on your view. But maybe when you go to quantum travel, you can turn those casts off so you can enjoy the vistas. That's all for me. Now we have our MFDs ready, and let me bring Yogi back to tell you all about flying your ship. They Thank you very much. They didn't really mention if you could turn your UI off completely. I wonder if you, you'll be able to do that. OK, at this point, our ship is fully, fully powered up, ready to fly. Pre-flight is complete. So Brent, please uh, take off. Put the landing gear in and oh, let me go back to fly. a little bit here. is complete. Um, so yeah, that was the UI. Now we're going to get into the actual flying of the ship, and we're going to see if I. I really wish that we had gotten more atmospheric and like hover flight with this, but we'll get to see kind of how the flight experience is changing in space, which is something that's been contentious for a long time. So I'm interested in hearing from people who maybe haven't been satisfied with the flight experience so far what they think of what they're seeing here. So, Brent, please uh, take off, put the landing gear in, and bring us out. Have you seen the interaction? This is great, isn't it? OK, so um, one of the problems we always have in uh, space games is to produce a sense of speed. Space is, is big. And the sense of speed is always produced by you know small things going around you. So although it's not very visible here, the VFX team has actually added space dust. So in the future, you can tell where your ship is going, even, by out, uh, even without looking at instruments. Another thing we're focusing on as well is uh, G-force reactions. Haven't we uh, always had space dust? That's an interesting mention. Uh, so Brent, if you could jump, come to a stop for a second. When your ship is sitting like that, and you strafe left and right, you have these small head motions. Uh, that basically make your head and your body react to the g-forces they're currently enduring. We're actually increasing them now. We also added rotational g-forces into the mix, so if Brand is now rotating the ship to the left, you also can see that your head is swaying a little bit. Things get a little bit more interesting um, when Brand is actually taking boost into the mix. So if he um, now boosts forwards, we now added a camera shake, we added uh, FOV changes, um, and this all then plays together with the other things like, you know, the other exhaustion effects that we have. So overall, the ship should now feel a little bit more reactive than before. The same thing, sorry. <laughs> I'm interested in seeing how this feels. It looks a little exaggerated to me right now, but I am wondering if when I'm under control of it, how it's going to feel. I'm sure they will allow you to tune down the animations, but... Uh... It's, it is pretty extreme. And people who have flown have said that it does feel like that. So, I mean, it's not like it's completely unrealistic. It just might be too extreme. Or it might look too extreme as we're watching it on a different video. At the same time, we reduce the um, extensions that your uh, that the look-ahead code is, does, uh, is doing. So, um, we basically narrowed it down a little bit so it mixes better with the GeForce reaction so that even when you don't have a head tracker or something like that, it will still feel uh, pretty good. But this is just a minor change. Um, we also improved the flight controls themselves. So take a look at the speed gauge, for example. It's a little bit uh, <laughs> twitchy today. What that speed gauge is telling you, the number that's currently moving, is what kind of speed goal Brent is actually putting in. If he puts his stick all the way forward, the left one, you will now be able to see and read the number that you're asking IFCS to speed and forward uh, momentum. This also allows us to bring back the... Uh, the only thing that throws me off here is that the current speed number, which you can see here, is the same color as the desired speed, which is here, instead of the current speed, which is white. 
I'm not sure why you would have the color for this one match this one when the numbers don't, but maybe that was just like a little a, a glitch or a miss. It's optimization kind of polish thing they need to do. Otherwise, I do really like that we can now see what we're asking of our throttle. Makes it a lot easier for everybody to set a throttle for like wingmen flying and then all launch at the same time going the same speed without having to adjust. Then forward uh, momentum. This also allows us to bring back the uh, sticky throttle we had uh, pre 3.5 where you now if you play with mouse and keyboard you can press w and s to increase and decrease your speed and let go of the key and the ship will not automatically come to a stop of course this is all completely configurable so you can enable that or not if you want oh. <laughs> Okay, Brian, give me some hot flying now, like uh, blackout and all that. <laughs> okay, so um, another thing we changed in the flight model is that we actually looked at the tricoding exploits. These are really important for PvP and racing uh, players among you, because tricoding gives us a mathematical so, problem. So yeah, when you're when you're going on and off boost like this really quickly, it it really does not uh, it doesn't come through well. I don't think going back and forth like that really really fast. They're gonna have to polish that in. Hey, Holson Coop, I'm sorry I missed your uh, your sub, you and Dungeon Unchained. Thank you both so much for the support. I really appreciate it. That we're trying to resolve. On some ships, when you try court, you get actually up to 50% more acceleration. That huge difference uh, actually makes a lot of the ship difference meaningless. So we're cutting back on those. So um, the first implementation of that is already available in the master mode testing areas in 3.21, I think. Um, but we're improving the um, algorithm right now so that it actually is, let, uh, is less punishing um, in future master mode builds. Uh, this is actually a, a current version, so as long as you go roughly forward, you get the full Gs um, from, your, from, your back, from your back engines. Okay, so now the biggie in the room. We're talking master modes. Master modes is by far the biggest change we're doing on the ship gameplay. In general, all of your ships will be put into, or will get a master mode setup. And the master mode is affecting basically everything surrounding uh, everything on the ship. The ship itself, the, the, the flight model a little bit, but specifically the items and what they do. Um, and there are two master modes we're going to talk today about. One is SCM, which stands for Space Combat Maneuvering, and the other one is Navigation. So let's look into uh, SCM. SEM is the mode that Brent currently has um, has active. So you see the um, Brent. Can you go into the uh, indication, please, for the master mode? Just point with the mouse there, if you can. Yeah. So this is your current master mode. It says SEM. When you you use SEM for basically all the gameplay that is not traversal, so a combat, mining, salvaging, you're using it for that, you have full access to your combat system. Your shields are working, <laughs> your thruster boost is fully active, your weapons are working. It's the high performance, high alertness mode that you're in. However, we will heavily restrict how fast we can go, um, we, we can go with your ship. Okay, Brent, go to um, full max speed. So this Gladius on max speed and SEM can reach about 225 meters per second. That might seem slow compared to what you have in the pew right now, but it's still pretty fast. However, you can extend that speed. Um, Brent, if you just go forward and boost. So the Gladius can extend up to 500 me 550 meters per second. On this slide here, you can see the speed, gate, uh, the speed spaces we're talking about. So if you're just walk, uh, flying around, in SEM, which is like the max speed of your, of your ship, you can reach the 225 meters per second. If you boost, you can reach up to 500 or 550. However, that boost space is not spheric. That means if you boost forward, you reach higher speeds than if you boost backwards. That is really important for space combat maneuvering because, or for dogfighting in general, because it discourages backstrafing. It actively actually punishes backstrafing, and it creates more interesting combat maneuvers. Um, the PvP players among you, they basically call this uh, encouragement to closing the gap, which is basically more forward-centric combat, which is much, much more exciting than backstrafing and just trying to get some shots on. It also forces you as combat players to, uh, to commit to the decisions you did earlier in the fight. So it's going to be, uh, we think it's much more exciting. <laughs> okay. So, in short, you pick SCM when you need to fight, when you want to fight, or when you need to fight, right? Um, 
The thing with the master mill switches is that they do not happen instant. Keep in mind, they folks, these measurements are in meters so per second. Into, uh, the second mode, which is navigation. So navigation mode is basically... It's not, I wouldn't say this is like space fast, but I, I think it's still pretty fast considering the um, we're flying... We're not just flying in space, we're flying in canyons, caves, around buildings and stuff. So I think that having a scale that would be too high would be iffy. Maybe not a linear scale, but I don't really know how they'd do it. This is more like the system they used back in... Um, uh, this is how the original flight model kind of worked for Star Citizen, which was they had a very high level of speeds meant for navigation and low level speeds meant more for maneuverability. And, and things like that. Um, I prefer that because I do think that I, I like, I get too overwhelmed with combat trying to maintain slow speeds but have all the freedom of fast speeds and that's on me, you know? Uh, but it seems like they probably, they've tried to limit people, they've tried to encourage people to limit their speeds but people don't do it. So I think now they're trying to force people and I'm not a big fan of it but uh, if it works to make the game better and more fun, um, doesn't take too much away from the thought process of combat, which I don't think it really does. There's a lot more in combat than just your speed. What's healthy for the game is healthy for the community. Of SCM. Well, <laughs> what uh, this kind does, of. it gives you a high speed, low performance mode. Your shields, they will collapse. Your weapons will not be able to fire. Your defensive systems will, will not be functional, um, but you have higher speeds. So in math mode, you can still speed, uh, reach the speeds of uh, what you have currently in the PU, something, I mean, depending on the ship, sometimes 1,000 meters or 1,400 meters per second. Um, but all your regenerative systems, so regenerating uh, the weapon capacitor, your thruster boost, will be inhibited. So this means when you want to go fast, you need to be very, very careful when you want to swap over. So imagine you're in a fight and you want to escape. You should not do it right away because if you just swap to navigation mode in the hope to flee, you are being left with no shields. And the first thing that will go offline when you are hitting with distortion guns is the quantum drive. And that is important because the quantum drive will spool automatically up when you enter nerf mode and it will then unlock the higher speeds. So this means when you're in nerf mode and you're fighting, you're very vulnerable, so you should get out as fast as possible. Luckily, <laughs> Navigation mode not only allows you a higher speed, but also uh, gives you access to the new quantum travel experience, which we're going to show in a, in a minute. So that is enough point that you see there on screen. This is the uh, point where I want to go to and quantum travel to. Before we do that, I need to quickly explain what this is about. So currently in the PU, when you quantum travel from A to B, you're actually not, not really moving. You're going on a spline. And I think this is one of my favorite frame, parts that. of all of CitizenCon. I've just been so excited to see what they do with quantum travel, and I think they did a really good job with the effects. I love it. It's kind of minimal. It's still very pretty to look at. You can see your surroundings, but you also realize you are in a bubble transporting. It's more than just press a button and go. There's a process to it. It feels like they're probably planning on it giving people outside of the ship more of an experience to watch. Overall, I think this is just a great step up for quantum travel and the functionality around it kind of builds in a, a role for a navigator now. Line. So there's basically no, no meaningful gameplay we can add there. The new quantum travel experience is fully physicalized. Physics is always on, which means when you quantum travel from A to B, you're actually accelerating using our awesome physics engine. And because it's physicalized, it, give us, it gives us a lot more meaningful gameplay we can, we can play with. So, Brent will start the quantum travel in a second. What will happen then is, your quantum drive will initiate the jump. You will see an effect that distorts the space around you. And you will accelerate forward. During the acceleration process, and this, so this is the time until you actually wait, reach your cruise speed, the ship will experience forces. And you as a player, you're responsible to counter these forces. So there is an element of failure. Okay, Brent, um, let's show that. And take your hands off. See, I like this. I like it because you can tell he's not actually in quantum travel yet. I like that there is a progression to the effects and the way quantum travel looks as you go from this sort of entrance 
period that he's in right now um, in which he crashes out of, and, and you can see he's kind of entering the bubble there and continuing to accelerate. Um, this sort of like entrance period that he's in right now, which he crashes out of versus when he locks in the bubble and they're actually going, going. you can tell the effects are changing and I love that. Anyways, let's, let's watch. Oh. Nice sounds. Love the sound effects. One more time. Also, you can tell as he gets further and further outside of the trajectory of the path, you can see like it gets very destable up ahead and starts to arc electricity or whatever. Cool effects. So what you just saw is basically the failed attempt to quantum travel. Brad wasn't countering the forces, therefore he was thrown out, the, the quantum bubble collapsed and threw you out. Your ship doesn't like that. IFCS needs five, six seconds to recover from that, during which time you, uh, you're, just, you're just tumbling, right? So, um, so, and this is not just uh, like dependent on your, on your skills. If you think selecting a proper quantum drive doesn't matter in the future, <laughs> Think again. You want to take care of your quantum drive. You want to repair it and keep it in good shape. So if you buy a cheap one, your travel will not necessarily be faster, but it might be harder. Okay, so Brent, show us how it's done properly. Sounds though. Bubble locked. The bubble is locked. You can now go hands off. The sound okay, so design is much better. There's a variant of quantum travel, and this is for short-range jumps. Sometimes you jump somewhere or you go somewhere, and you, and you see the next point of interest is like 1,200 kilometers away. We're not going to force you anymore to travel that by hand. You will use a technique called quantum boosting. It's a quantum-based short-range jump for like something between a couple of hundred kilometers to like 30,000 kilometers or so. I, I am going to agree with somebody in chat. They're saying that a better bubble-locked indicator would be nice. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. And that's probably some feedback they'll get for that. When you use quantum boosting, the process is practically the same, but the quantum bubble will not stabilize itself. So you need to be hands-on for, for the whole time. And the speeds are naturally, well, slower, but it's not slow. It's still quantum traveling, right? Okay, so Brent, can you boost to... Uh... Oh, reinforcement needed. Yeah, let's go there. Let's boost. Oh, actually, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so what Brent is currently um, <laughs> showing here is, I think I forgot to mention, quantum boosting works in every direction. You don't need nav points. <laughs> right, that was honestly, that was a very, uh, he just very suddenly yeah, did that, but there. basically he just jumps. Oh, actually. He literally just starts a boost and jumps. So you don't have to set any sort of like a waypoint. You don't have to... Um, you don't have to pick something on your star map. You just press a button and you can start flying, which is... Sorry. <laughs> we've been waiting for that for Thank years. <laughs> okay, so what Brent is currently um, showing here is, I think I forgot to mention, quantum boosting works in every direction. You don't need nav points. Brent is awesome, thank you. Okay, so now, please boost to reinforcements needed. So if there's enough points and you boost, your quantum travel system will pick that knife point to go to. Oh. 
little bit of visual glitch there. Welcome to Pyro 3. As you can see, there's quantum travel and quantum boost. So quantum travel is long distance, quantum boost is short. See, there's a lot of UI happening right now. There's a lot of context there. And this is not an online demo, it's a single player. So that means all these units there, <laughs> they're friendly and hostile, so they're probably fighting with each other. Which is a good segue to talk about AI improvements. And there's one man who can tell you all about AI. This is the man with the nicest legs at CIG. Well, please welcome Diego Marti Mason. What do you guys think of the bullet collision animation or uh, graphics that they've changed? You can see these like bullets bouncing off of armor from much further, at least shrapnel coming off the armor. What do you think of that? So who's excited to see the new AI changes? <laughs> Hi everyone, as you said, my name is Diego Marti Mason and I am the AI programmer focusing on the fly combat. Over the past year, we've been working on delivering a thrilling experience to the AI encounters. Let me first walk you through our journey. We first started looking at the current AI behavior in the PU. We quickly realized how uniform fighting was and how we were not using all of the tech available to us to make a more interesting experience. We had the foundations and we wanted to learn more about how you, the players, do your combat encounters in the verse. So we did this by getting combat recordings, analyzing videos, and internal playtesting, where we were hammering each other for hours. It was fun, unless you went up against experienced fighters like Bayer. Anyway, with all of these data, we started crafting the first prototype, with the focus of bringing that human behavior into the AI brain. When the first version was ready to be tested, I handed it out to one of the best internal pilots in the team. Yogi. So Yogi, what do you think about my first prototype? It was an exercise of humility. <laughs> it was an exercise of humiliation. <laughs> I hated it and I blame Diego. <laughs> <laughs> so this was due to the AI being able to keep a good range control and a perfect orbit around their target while maintaining a constant firing solution. Come on, it's a computer. We learned a lot from our initial prototype, and it really helped us to define what we wanted to deliver. A combat experience where the AI yet challenging makes mistakes, just like us humans. We want players to leave every combat encounter with a feel of satisfaction by encouraging you to keep on the move and make use of the vehicle systems available to you, so you can at least try to win the fight. Let's see how we brought this new iteration of combat to life. We broke down in multiple stages. The first one, interception. Then the main engage phase, which we broke in different tactics. Strafer, jouster, chaser, and finally, disengage. Let's switch to the demo. As you can see, Brent has encountered a skirmish. Let's talk more about the combat flow there. Okay, we will start with interception. After acquiring the target, the primary aim is to close the gap with the target. If the AI is already near the target, the inter interception phase is skipped completely. If it's too far, it will tell the AI to use the new master mode to swap into navigation mode and make use of the full speed to chase. Swapping back to SCM mode when we are in a striking distance. That leads us to our second phase, engage. So you could probably pretty easily game some of the AI by like getting them to keep switching between the modes. Uh, strategy. Here the AI selects an adequate tactic based on combat environment. These are choosing via the traits and tactic selector system. You've heard more about them in the previous talk by Francesco. So let's talk about the strafer. As this is a six degrees of freedom game, it's the natural combat shape adopted by pilots. We have to relate to the same behavior to our AI, ensuring also that orbits are close and adding variations to include rolling. Strafers will break combat if they cannot keep an orbit. So now we see how the hammerhead is being attacked by hornets. These hornets are jousters. Jousters consist of performing straight-in attacks whilst outputting a lot of firepower, blowing through, 
smooth turning, and repeating. We added variations for the more skilled pilots, like a skid roll attacks, that provide a spider-like flight path. I feel like we're watching the strafer, right? Not the jouster, because he's not jousting. Jousters are also good at monitoring for back strafers, so if they cannot get into strike distance, they will just break. And finally, the chaser. Now, Brain is going to get there in a second, but the chaser is going to be the cutlass, which is following one of the hornets and is allied with the uh, hammerhead. I love this, this information readout when you're scanning ships. It's so much better. It's much easier to understand what, you're, what information you're getting. Now, we are really far, far away, 10 kilometers. So the chaser, it will try to always stay on the target six. The idea is to force the target into a defensive stance by making them turn into the chaser. This maneuver will be seen mainly in squads and atmosphere combat. The final phase, which can happen at any time, depending on the combat situation, is disengage. This phase is triggered based on constantly listening to multiple events in parallel. To name a few, critical health, damage to shields, or weapons depleted. There is also a shorter version of disengage that we call pace breaks, which occurs during long periods of combat due to fatigue, nature of the combat and contest. These pace breaks are short, and the main objective is to perform a simple maneuver to gain a new advantage position and strike again. This new flow is what encompasses the core of our new AI fly combat experience, in combination with AI traits that will give designers the tools to tailor each combat encounter in the verse. Like, for example, they can choose the ace traits that will allow AI pilots to make use of all of the ship's angular velocity so they can keep a more precise orbit. So for some of you out there, it's going to be a good challenge. And the point of this, somebody was asking, is basically that you're just going to run into different types of fighters. Like you're going to be fighting AI and you're going to have to learn how they fight and learn to counter it. While we've been, while we've, we've been mainly focusing on fighter behavior, we've also started to follow the same process to other ship types, like gunships and capitals. In the near future, we want to deliver experience where going against a capital ship like an Idris is a tough fight that unless you bring the right combinations of tools, meaning ships that are equipped to take down capital ships, you will get demolished by their powerful turrets. Now, after all of the feedback, in our first internal playtest, we've received a lot of constructive and positive feedback. And Yogi is not longer being destroyed by the AI, so I think he likes it a bit more. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy the new AI. And back to you, Yogi. Thank you, Diego. OK, so now we're going to talk about, uh, we heard about how AI makes my life hard. Now let's talk about how to return the favor. We're talking weapons. So the weapon and aiming systems and squadrons, they went through a lot of changes. I can only mention a couple of them, so I will go through them relatively quickly. First thing on our to-do list is basically weapon tuning. At the moment, almost all weapons in the PU are practically the same. In squadron, that's not the case. Almost all weapons have different properties. Uh, they are being they have like different projectile velocities, different DPS numbers. But they're not just um, different in terms of these numbers. They also they also feel different. Remember the Cinch cannons from like a couple of years ago? They were <laughs> they were very powerful weapons, but they were extremely easy to use, which which made them meta weapons. So we're going to bring the Cinch cannon back, but we make sure that the amount of work you put into these cannons in order to employ them is on par with the other guns. So there's a lot of stuff that we're going to do um, to make sure that we, like weapons have very a lot of pros and cons um, and avoid uh, meta. Specifically for this build, Brent is equipped with a nose, uh, I think a close and burner laser repeater. Can you fire it once? Yeah. And the other weapon he has is a, uh, he has um, two weapons on the wings, which are um, Gats ballistics, uh, sorry, Gats, Gats cannons, uh, size three. With one push, they're actually firing two. So we're also going to have uh, burst weapons um, and so on. OK, cool. So a problem we have in space games is controlling the engagement ranges, because we want to bring the fights close. But the problem is that, well, <laughs> how do I put this? Um, 
Weapons, usually, uh, in order to bring them close, what the game, the game does usually do is they just restrict the ranges. Like in the Pew, uh, a lot of the weapons have exactly a range of 1,400 kilometers, which means often the fights occur at 1,399 meters. Um, this, is not for, this is not a good um, way for us to control the weapons. Um, and we, dis we tried out things like damage fall off, so that uh, bullets get more damaging the closer you are. But the problem there is how do you communicate that to the player? So we're going to do a couple of different things with that in the future. Let's see when the graph comes on. OK, so show of hands or show, which of you has an Ares? OK, as an Ares pilot, you might uh, know the following problem. You have a target. You're going to aim at it. Um, and then you, um, this is, what the? OK, <laughs> I need to go back. OK, there's actually some stuff not, not there anymore. I don't know. What happens oh, man, when you annoying. aim with your crosshair on the, over the pip um, is that you actually not aiming at the pip. The legacy system gives you a pip which does not show you where the pip, where the weapon needs the pip. The new aiming system actually produces the pips based on where the weapon sees them and reprojects them on the target. That means the aiming information you're getting is actually much, much more precise. And uh, this is a very interesting... Um, sorry, I said the completely wrong thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Okay. <laughs> Yogi. Controlling weapon ranges, sorry. I'll do it now, sorry. <laughs> I missed that part. Okay, sorry. Okay, controlling ranges. In the future, all the weapons will get much, much longer ranges. Size 1 weapons will fly to up to 5 or 6 kilometers before the despawn. Wow. The way how we do this, wait, the way how we do this is we're adding spread. Because spread is for us is a very good indication on how to control the ranges. This is not a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship there, so don't worry, you won't get like spread with like 20 degrees uh, offset or something like that. Don't worry, right? But if we compare the spread of the, uh, spread of the weapon with the target size, we know when the weapon is in range. We know when, the, uh, when you actually are close enough so that the majority of your hits can hit. And we're telling, that. We're telling you that via the, um, by the aiming system now. So Brent, let's go back to the demo. If you get a green pip and a green crosshair, it means you have a high chance of your weapons hitting, hitting the target. If Brent takes a little bit of a step back and waits until the pips and the crosshair turn red, this does not mean that the ship is out of range. You can still hit it, but you might waste bullets. Um, this also has the benefit that, I'm not sure if you saw that before, but if you look at how many, how many Dude, bullets are- Dude, he shot that ship once and they just piled on him. In the air, you're actually getting a lot of bullets, uh, uh, a lot more bullets, and it just looks a lot better. Okay, Brent, just, just kill these guys now. Bam. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, so um, that was the, this one. Okay, a thing you might have seen is that um, Brent has, is loaded with size 3 guns on size 3 gimbals. That means we're removing the M-1 system. That <laughs> the reason for that is the original intention of like controlling the performance between joystick and mouse players just didn't work out, and the new aiming system is flexible enough to deal with these differences. So we're just removing it and keep going. So, next point, pip grouping. If you have different weapons of different, with different projector velocities, you will get different pips. Because merging the pips makes no sense for us anymore, because the weapons are going to have vastly different projectile speeds. So if Brent, for example, enables all the weapons now, you get separate pips. So let's talk a bit about pip optimizations here. And this is the thing I messed up before. Again, who is an Ares? <laughs> if you aim at your target, you get a pip, right? Your Ares owners know that. You aim at the pip, you shoot, you miss. And this is because the pip is not being shown where you need it. In the future, we're actually offsetting the pip where the weapon sees it and then reproject this onto the crosshair. Like that. And when you then hit, you hit. No, when you then shoot, you hit. Um, 
And this is, of course, also communicated by the aiming system. So when the when the pips turn green and when the uh, when the crosser turns green, just shoot. Okay. So now to the actual best part. We cannot take down this hammerhead. It's too big for us. We need, to, but we can cripple it. The weak points on the hammerhead are the turrets. The way are we going to do this in the future is with precision targeting mode. Brent. Enable precision targeting mode. So I was not, did not expect anything like this. I think this is one of the most surprising things to me in the whole game. And uh, that's because I'm not a flight, I'm not, I don't, I don't pilot ships, but this idea of zooming in and creating a whole new UI so that you can fight almost permanently in this new mode is an interesting choice. I hope it works. I'm guessing they've tested it a lot to determine that it does, but it, um, it changes the combat look a lot, and it certainly is going to lead to people fighting in different ways. What this does, it does three things. You get this full zoom on the target. Um, you get a lower RPM of your weapons, which increases or decreases the spreads for more precision. And you get the painting mechanic. Anywhere where you put your crosshair on that, on that ship, it will tell the gimbal system where to aim at. So if Brent now attacks the turrets, your aiming system will automatically lead the shots. Bam! One turret down. Sorry, let me take a, another look at that. Mechanic. Weapons, which increases a bit. Uh, also, by the way, keep in mind, guys, this is obviously not how combat is going to work when you're blowing up a hammerhead. This is sure. A, it's with precision targeting mode. It's a Brent? hammerhead. Enable precision targeting Okay, see. Precision targeting mode. Brent? Oh, that's because he stops. Enable precision targeting mode. There we go. What this does, it does three things. You get this full zoom on the target. Um, I see. So I missed this. I missed that precision targeting mode gets rid of the pips and just paints parts of the ship. That makes a lot of sense because they really want us to be more about targeting, targeting certain parts of the ship. This is what we were talking about earlier. This is why you're not just going to uh, get shot and blow up. You're going to get shot and you're going to lose parts. You're going to lose pieces of your ship. Your things are going to get damaged. Specific things. Some people might want to take out your thrusters. Some people might want to just take out your shields. Some people want to take out your power plant so they can board you. The, the, the goal won't always be the same. It definitely won't be blowing you up all the time. If somebody wants to pirate you, they can't blow you up, right? If somebody wants to get a bounty on your ship, they can't blow you up. So this idea of figuring out an easy way for us to target certain spots was kind of necessary and I didn't know how they were going to do it. I hope this solution works. You get a lower RPM of your weapons which increases or decreases the spreads for more precision and you get the painting mechanic. Anywhere where you put your crosshair on that on that ship it will tell the gimbal system where to aim at. So if Brent now attacks the turrets your aiming system will automatically lead the shots. Bam! One turret down. It's basically just auto-aim. It's just auto-aim for not, you know, uh, auto-aim without seeing the auto-pip. Um, I, I, which I think makes sense. This is like how they help players on controllers um, in, in shooters play a little bit better because everybody in shooters is not very great on their own. Just like with this, we're... Yeah, we can aim, but we're not super great at aiming, uh, you know, 500 meters at a five meter target. So I think this can help. And if you don't like it, I guess don't use it. But uh, it seems like there are some upsides and downsides to using this, this method of fighting. Okay, so this hammer had now understood that it's not good. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to stand a chance right now. But this will be the way how you in the future will, will uh, fight um, against sub-targets and so on. The good thing about this, it also works even without um, painting the target directly. So you can do very, very precise warning shots. Um, and, and there's no aim assist that kind of like destroys your aiming processes. 
Okay, so the five. See, so in chat, somebody said everyone's going to use this because it's easier. That is the whole point of this. They want to put these things in the game so that everyone uses it, so that they can balance it. Guys, they're building a game. They're not releasing it. This is all part of testing. Like, if this system doesn't work, they'll change it. This is happening because the last system didn't work. So we give them the feedback on this, and we figure out a way that this will work better for the players. It's now over. Sorry, I need to rush this a little bit because I messed up stuff before. And you're going to look at Pyro 3. OK, Brent, switch to nav mode and bring us down to that landing spot. So Pyro 3 is also called Bloom. It's a very big planet with a nice atmosphere. And um, oh, something wrong with throttle. <laughs> oh, well, something's wrong, wrong with the throttle. We'll try to go down as fast as possible, though. <laughs> I said gameplay demo might have bugs. <laughs> okay. Let me go there now. Okay. Yeah, steeper angle that works. Squadron is feature complete. <sighs> okay. But so that's why this the, stuff um, isn't coming into Star Citizen yet. This is going to be balanced differently. They do not like the uh, they do like the vacuum of space. They're well, if there are things in Star Citizen that don't work in the PvP aspect, they'll have to change them to be different from Squadron. That's that's just why Star Citizen is going to take so much longer to make. The spaceships here, right? And we have thruster efficiency curves on these thrusters. So at some point, especially the MEF thrusters, they will cease working because they don't like atmosphere. They will overheat very, very quickly. So there's the question. What happens when you go down to a planet and you want to rotate your ship with your thrusters off? Well, we'll see. Can you go to external view? Can you waggle your tail? <laughs> okay, back first person. Okay, so what you see here is the new aerodynamics model. Because obviously our uh, left stick is somewhat damaged or so, uh, <laughs> we can't be as fast as we want. Um, actually, Brent, can you try W dash on the keyboard instead? So the control surfaces oh. are a big deal. Um, we can actually go back to when they first tried to, I don't even know what it would be called, um, Citizen Con aspects of flight or something along those lines, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't remember exactly. Look at this. YouTube search is just so bad. <laughs> None of this has to do with anything I search except for these top two. Um, crap. Yeah, I don't remember what exactly it's called, but they showed us, um, they showed this to us a long time ago. Of course, again, it's, that's what most of this Citizen Con was. Um, just search lift. Most of this Citizen Con has been about, it's not this one, but this one's related, about um, bringing a lot of this stuff that they've been talking about into the actual game. Finally, I don't know if I'll be able to find this one though. So I don't think it was a citizen con. I think it was an inside star citizen. Forget it. I'm not gonna be able to find it. But um, the control surfaces is important because again, this is gonna change all ships and how they fly in atmosphere. Um, this is just like with engineering, something that people are going to hate. People are gonna say this is making the game too hard and it's too complicated and it's too much. Apologies, this is not going to be an easy game if you want to do everything. If you want to be somebody who flies large ships, you're going to have to practice at it. Um, if you want to pull high-speed dogfights in atmosphere, you're going to have to practice on it. And control surfaces is another part of that. It's aerodynamics. It makes certain ships not fly well. It makes certain ships fly better. Uh, it could be the difference between flying with a raft and flying with a Zeus CL. I don't know. Like, the, um, this is just one more thing that adds into why somebody chooses or tunes or engineers a certain ship a certain way. Okay, so what you see here is the new aerodynamics model. Because obviously our uh, left stick is somewhat damaged or so, uh, <laughs> we can't be as fast as we want. Um, actually, Brent, can you try W dash on the keyboard instead? Oh, it doesn't work. Oh. 
No, it doesn't. Yep. Okay. No, the stick is uh, is the stick is uh, affecting us. Okay. Anyways, we're gonna go down as much as uh, as far as possible. So the new aerodynamic system is a complete replacement of the aerodynamic system that you currently have, and you need um, you need your control surfaces to actually uh, turn the ship around. It simulates the airflow over your lift surfaces, and therefore, the slower you become, the less effective those uh, control surfaces will be in order to turn your ship. So we can demonstrate this. So if Brent just sits here and yaws left and right, you will see he cannot go f uh, further than that. That is in line with what real airplanes uh, also experience when they're trying to use the rudder to yaw left, uh, left, uh, left and right. So what Brent can do here is he can roll and he can pull to actually change um, this direction. Okay, so just for this demo, we added a button. The button is called thrust to disconnect. Because um, at the moment in the PU, when you go through a planet, you're using the thrusters to rotate. We're not doing that anymore. So Brent, disconnect the thrusters, please, and put the ship into a purposeful stall. A stall happens when the airflow over a wing ceases. Um, or over a lift surface ceases. And then at some point you will not have any authority anymore and your ship will not turn and so on and you will basically fall out of the sky. That is naturally a state that every plane wants to avoid naturally, right? And this is happening right here. Brent is not able to, uh, to use the control surfaces right now because the ship is in a, in, in a process of stalling. However, the airflow will pull the nose back into the wind and once you have enough speed, he can actually... Wouldn't you well, just be able to boost out of it though? I feel like you could just... Is he talking about when you actually turn your engines off or why is he stalling in it? And I, I'm... Are they, is he just showing that that's how the engine works? He's not actually... You said they added a button just for this demo. So I'm guessing um, this is just kind of to show that the control surfaces are functional. Yeah, he's just showing it off. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. We'll pull the nose back into the wind. And once you have enough speed, he can actually... Well... He gets authority back over those control surfaces. <laughs> that means for you as players, what you, could, what you can actually do, you can do aero braking, you can do pure gliding if you want to. Uh, you can even do like competitions like, I don't know, like drop ships out of orbit and then see how fast far they glide. This is all possible with a new system. Yeah, it was airflow. He turned so the let's talk about he the, turned the thrusters off. How do you come to a stop now? To come to a stop with the new system, you need to purposefully put the ship into a stall. But don't worry, when we don't have the thrusters disconnected, IFCS will help you. So you're gonna bring down the speed more and more until you're reaching stall speed, which is about now. And then the thrusters will kick in and, and catch you. See, now this is the part where I figured they would talk about the heat system which is a big part of, you know, keeping us on the move and using our control services, but I don't think he mentions it. That means, however, you are now in a state that the thrusters don't, don't like, right? So at the moment we have turned this up, but in the future you will not be able to hold this for long. Oh my god. Look at me. Just premonitions constantly. <laughs> So but yeah, that's really important, guys. You won't be able to just hover like this. Not only is the hydrogen fuel dropping really quickly, but your thrusters will also kind of start to take some wear over time. So at the moment, we have turned this up, but in the future, you will not be able to hold this for long. So if Brent, for example, now from a hover, strafe is left. More left, more left, more left. The wind flow again pulls the ship over, and you go forward again. I'm really sad that they didn't have that in here. I really, really want to know what kind of VFX and SFX they're going to do for ships with VTOL because they're going to have to really sell the idea that you shouldn't be just hovering there for too long. Okay, so now, Brand, now show us uh, how to come to a uh, hover. And uh, do we have some water here? Oh, yeah, there's our point. Okay. This game looks so good when it runs at smooth FPS. Okay, so there's our landing point.
can become a little bit slower, I don't know, 100 meters per second. So we're trying to land somewhere here. Whoa, look at this! <laughs> Yeah, that water is great, like, awesome. Okay, so now we're coming to a... Uh, so now Brent will try to uh, land with a broken throttle. <laughs> and yeah, he's aided a little bit here by, uh, by the landing gear. So he has landing gear out, I think because that uh, automatically enables precision mode at the moment so that you're a little bit slower, but you can of course like turn this off as a player. No, actually, you're not even burning hydrogen fuel at a different rate and wouldn't even make sense. <laughs> your main thrusters would burn more, right? And then you come smoothly down to a landing. The best way to land your ship is in decoupled because you can just like very smoothly land it on the surface. And clunk. And now you're gonna power down the ship using the new interactions. Engines off first. Then we're in the relaxed pose again, as Ines showed before. Power off. And the canopy off. Uh, no, open, not off. Don't, don't put the canopy off. <laughs> and get out of the ship and uh, probably go for a swim or something. Okay, that was a bit of a buggy, bumpy ride, but um, thank you for taking um, the time with us. Awesome. So yeah. Um, and we'll see you in the verse. Thank you. So those are our two uh, demos for the day, folks. Honestly, the, um, see, could have, what else do they have uploaded? Um, I think they were good. The one, the two things missing from the flight one were both the, uh, the landing hologram that they want to do and also the, uh, uh, yeah, these are all pretty long. Um, the landing hologram and also, uh, the heat systems are two things that I wanted to see there, but otherwise, um, that was all pretty good. And then on engineering, I, I would have loved to hear more about what you can do in terms of tuning, as they talk about tuning, giving you options for how you're going to engineer your ship, but they didn't go too much into it. Um, so yeah, some stuff to show, but this is very exciting stuff that they have already shown. And I think, um, all of the stuff we're seeing, it needs to be balanced. It needs to be worked into the game and made sure it's actually fun. But it's all stuff that they have talked about in the past and like made kind of um, statements about doing and not necessarily promises, but just set our expectations. And it's been a long time waiting. So it's good to see it working in game. And I, I hope we get to see it soon.